welcome. I hope uh, your trip to Canada so far has been warm and welcoming. Um, I wanted to start by asking you, dedicate a great deal of time to traveling around the world. And I wanted to ask you about your insights on global trends in leading areas in tech around the world currently. Oh, wow. Um, well, Big one. Hello, hi. <laughs> uh, thanks for the incredible experience. Um, with many of you had some contacts and it was, it's been quite uh, impressive. Um, so global trends, well, one is that you can start a business anywhere. So if there's enough eagerness and, and uh, hunger and urgency, then uh, I mean, you have startup Gaza. So there, you know, even in the most unlikely places now, um, people are starting businesses and actually finding support and money and people to, uh, to grow them. So um, there's a lot of uh, democratization of, of technology and of knowledge about how to start businesses. So it's basically happening everywhere. That's, I think, one. Two, obviously, what you see here as the, as the kind of the, the capital of AI. AI is, is going, like digital was going in everywhere and, now, and then it was the platforms and now it's um, everything is going to be an AI play. That's, I think, a trend. And then, um, then there are a lot of buzzwords. Uh, maybe we go into them later. And how is the Netherlands competing with other ecosystems around the world? Um, well, we, we, um, so we're a small market. So you need to be uh, very open to attract talent. You need to be open, flexible, pragmatic, uh, because there's never going to be enough capital in the country. So you have to be open for capital coming from the outside. Um, you have to be open for talent coming from the outside. And you have to have a, a, a kind of entrepreneurial mindset that, uh, that is global or international from the start. So um, that's something that um, we're very, um, very keen on in the Netherlands. I think what uh, typically Netherlands is a very innovative and open economy and we've been very innovative in the old industries. So the kind of disruption and rapid scaling of new ventures is something that we are currently uh, learning. And uh, we have some good examples. It started in the, in the early 2000s with uh, Booking.com, but we didn't have the capital to, um, to fund it. So it was, um, it was bought by, um, by Priceline, and now it's, uh, I think, for 100 million or something, and now it's a $90 billion uh, dollar company. So this is uh, a scar that the Dutch ecosystem has that we, at the time, did not have the, the capital to actually uh, keep a company like that in the Netherlands. And now we had the recent successes with Elasticsearch and with um, Adyen, which is now a 22 uh, billion um, euro company. And so uh, these are the role models that are showing that you can actually build companies, big companies in the Netherlands and in Europe. And, uh, and, and they, they have really set the tone for a whole new cohort of, uh, of startups that are uh, following in their suit. And you know, given the number of competing interests that you must have on, on your time, um, why do you choose to focus on tech? Um, does anybody know a better thing to focus on than tech? <laughs> uh. Okay, um, fair enough. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm no, probably I can give you a biased. fair answer. I was uh, in charge of the digital agenda at the European Commission. I was the, um, the chief of staff of Nelly Kroos, who was the commissioner. And so we were, um, we were kind of the evangelist for digital. Uh, from 2010 onwards, and we didn't get much response. So none of the companies felt that this was something transformational. Uh, the governments felt, felt it was too technical, or we were kind of a vertical, like telecoms. And our message didn't come across. So we started, um, uh, and my boss, she was at the time 72, um, but very young at heart, and she said, we need to find new ambassadors. So we started a, a strategy going to all the tech events, a tech crunch, web summit, uh, uh, Le Web at the time in Paris. Um, to meet with startups and listen to them and say what they, uh, what they need. And so, um, and they needed role models, they needed acknowledgement and all that. And, uh, and so we set up um, the, um, uh, it was the, called the um, Digital Leaders um, Club with the founders of Skype and no Rovio and, um, uh, and Spotify and others to, uh, to show that, you know, digital was something that's going to be much more pervasive and people were thinking that it was going to uh, change, it would build a whole new set of, set of companies, and that, uh, and that it was actually possible in Europe. So that's kind of what ignited this whole flame in, uh, in me in, 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 you know, in, in supporting uh, entrepreneurship. Great, and you mentioned in there a few companies and 
and across several different countries, how important is collaboration as you continue in your role as Special Envoy? Um, well, co I, collaboration, I mean, in a, time, in a, in a, in a kind of the tr traditional sense of c countries collaborating, um, that's obviously important. But I think it's more about relationships and it's a building networks. And uh, it's I mean, like here, you have many people from very different backgrounds uh, getting to know each other. They will introduce you know, their companies to each other. They will co-invest. I think that's the kind of relationships that, uh, and the, the kind of collaborations that are really important. So it's much more at the level of, of people and level of institutions than it at the level of, uh, of, of governments, I feel. Because then you get, tend to get lost in governance and in all kinds of power uh, structures and, uh, and, and it's much more productive to work at a people's level. Um, and speaking of relationships, perhaps, you know, the question of how you ended up coming to Canada for this week of all the places you could be. So why Canada and why Toronto? You, they would never ask that in Silicon Valley, right? Um, <laughs> now, it shows that you still are very humble and, um, and that... Um, for the outside world, or maybe kind of this is new to you, but uh, Toronto really is a place that has been excelling in AI and in, in other, you know, in quantum and other um, technologies, and that um, you have been doing an incredible job in attracting talent and, re and retaining talent and uh, growing your, uh, your, your tech ecosystem. So, and, and the fact that you've been doing this actually in, since relatively short period of time and that your intervention has been so effective, it's something that the world is looking at, so uh, it's not surprising. Uh, you should ask the question, why haven't I come earlier? <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so, I, we did, when we were speaking, you did mention that the Netherlands has a specific focus around ethics and diversity in tech. Um, would you care to share with us a bit about how you're approaching uh, this is specific issue in your country? Um, well, diversity, um, our diversity statistics are really poor, and um, and I think we are we are very concerned that uh, also the the venture capital industry is very male dominated, and uh, about uh, I think 1.5 uh, percent of all investments in uh, in in venture in the Netherlands go to female led companies, and the the pipeline is 14 percent or something. So it means that it's not a pipeline issue. It's really, uh, there's a lot of implicit bias against uh, investing in, in uh, female-led um, uh, firms. And we know that diverse teams are actually performing better than all male teams or, or just uh, non-diverse teams. Because it's not just a gender thing, obviously. And um, so, uh, and it's, this is odd, you know, you know that something is better, but we're not doing it. And um, if you drill down, uh, you find that there's a lot of implicit uh, biases, and so first thing you need to do is make those implicit biases more um, more visible. Like we saw this morning, the the crash test in the cars. Uh, people just don't even realize that there are these biases against against women. And uh, one of the things that I found really shocking is, uh, but also very kind of uh, insightful, is that when uh, women pitch. For um, male venture capitalists, they tend to ask about their credentials. So it's it's looking back. It's like, do you you know um, what gives you the right to be here, and are are you worth me spending money in you, or investing money in you? Whereas if it would be a male founder, they would look. They you'd ask about what are you going to do looking forward. So what is the opportunity, and uh, and those things are, are implicit. And uh, once you make them explicit then people can't, um, they can't go back anymore. I think that's a wonderful place to leave it. Thank you so much for being our guest. It, we just enjoyed everybody who I've met said, oh my gosh, the prince, he's such a nice guy. Um, <laughs> he's so lovely. What so is this? You know, it's, I, it's always, oh, he's actually quite intelligent. Yeah. So, <laughs> or he reads his files. So this is, this is kind of confirms that the the common thinking about um, someone in my position is you are stupid, <laughs> you're boring, and um, well, anything else that you thought I wasn't. <laughs>